This morning's Torah portion is called Tetzaveh. Everybody say Tetzaveh. Yes. The, the Tav at the beginning of the word means you. Anytime you see a Tav at the beginning of the word, it's kind of like pointing to you to do something. And in this case, a za or where we get the, word, the root for mitzvah, is a command. So he's saying to Moshe, you command the priest and those that are preparing the oil for the tabernacle and the garments and the altar command them on how to prepare these things and what's amazing is he says you the very beginning is they ata tetzava et b'nei yisrael this means it's like a w they ata is and you ata is you Tetzava, you command. Why is he not just starting like it normally does, where it says, Vaidabar Adonai el Moshe, and spoke God to Moshe, Leomer, saying, and then he commands them. Why does it just say you and not mention Moses' name? Remember, Moses had asked when interceding for the children of Israel that God would rather blot his name from his book than to blot out the children of Israel. And when he said, blot my name from your book, he said, Sefer Ha, Sefer is book, Ha is yours. And the Ha, the ha comes from the Kaf at the end of the word, which has a gematria of 20. But rather than God, blotting out Moses' name from the Book of Life, he simply blotted his name out from the 20th Torah portion. So you could look at Sefer Ka as your book, or you could look at it as the 20th book in Hebrew. And so we're not going to see Moses' name mentioned anywhere in this Torah portion, which is interesting. We can find it in our Bibles in Exodus 27, verse 20, and we go through chapter 30, verse 10. And in chapter 20, we see these instructions on how to make the olive oil pure for the menorah by pounding it. And we're going to look at the symbolism of these beaten olives and what that means for us and what it meant for Yeshua as our example. We are to keep our light burning continually. And this oil that was pounded was to keep the menorah light burning continually. And we're going to compare the oil in this chapter, starting out this Torah portion, with what started out last week's Torah portion, was the instructions for the menorah. So he instructs how to build the menorah out of pure pounded gold. Then he instructs how to create the oil in this beginning Torah portion with pure pounded olives. And then in chapter 28, we read all about the priestly garments. And we can correlate this with last week's Torah portion in the middle. Remember how he described the coverings over the tabernacle? Now he's described the coverings for the human tabernacle. He says, build them, have them build me a tabernacle that I might dwell in them. It's all about man being restored to his image so that he can dwell in us. So first he builds a model of the heavenly tabernacle and tells about those coverings. Then he's talking about the priest as an example for us of how to live a pure and kodesh life, a pure and holy life. And so we're talking about the coverings for the priest and their symbolisms in chapter 28. And in chapter 29, we see the instructions for the altar of um, incense. And in the last week's Torah portion, it ended with the altar, uh, the brazen altar in the outer court. So you see a parallel with all, each chapter and last week's chapter, and we're going to see parallels in the Hoff Torah portion as well. In our parties, we see that the plain meaning is the instruction for the menorah oil, the priestly garments, and the altar. But we see God's character in that He is using these as symbols for us to understand the importance of us being made holy so that we can draw near to Him. Because He is a pure and holy God. And what does holy mean? It comes from the Hebrew word kodesh, which means to be set apart. So that which is common is not holy. We have to set apart ourselves from the world. We have to set apart Shabbat from the other six days and sanctify it. We have to set apart our thinking and our speech and our actions to be a set apart people as he has called his bride to be. And we're going to see glimpses of Messiah in every one of these chapters 
that has to do with elements of the tabernacle, like the beaten olive. It says that he was beaten for us, for our chastisement, right? For our iniquities. He's also the high priest that's interceding in the heavenly sanctuary. And the altar of sacrifice reminds us of his sacrifice, which was the greatest revelation of selfless love to man that's ever existed. So we're going to see hidden glimpses of Messiah throughout this Torah portion and apply it to our own lives, that we need to be refined as pure oil. If he shows us that he was rejected, despised by men, beaten and persecuted, then what did he tell us? If you follow me, they're not going to recognize you either, and you'll be persecuted for my name's sake. And that's exactly what we have to be willing to do, dying to the self, to the flesh, and allowing the spirit to thrive to the point where we're willing to lay down this earthly vessel for his name's sake and for our testimony of him. And we find our testimony through perseverance, through trial, just like the olive is beaten. We're going to talk about the parallels with how the spirit in us is purified through adversity, through trials, and through tribulations. And John in vision saw the end time remnant of God's people. And he said, here are they, here's the perseverance of the saints. And in Greek, saints is hagios, which comes from the root word hog, which a hog is, in Hebrew is a feast. So basically he's saying, here's the remnant, what they look like. They're feast keepers, and they keep the commandments of God. That's one, which is the written Torah, right? And they have their testimony in Yeshua, who's the living Torah. So really, the true definition of the end-time saints, or holy set-apart people, is that they're feast keepers, they're keeping God's written Torah and his Moedim, his timings, and they have a testimony of that word made flesh in the living Torah, in Yeshua. And so we see much beautiful symbolism, even in the gematria of the Torah portion's name, Tetzaveh, which means to, you command. We see that the Tav is equaling 400, and the Zadi is 90, the Vav is 6, and the He is 5, which gives it a total value of 501. And we see that other words with that same numerical value lend deeper understanding as to what he's commanding us. It's literally his word that he's commanding us. And his word, when it was made flesh, becomes the high priest. We call the high priest the Kohen Hagadol. And he's the Rosh, which means the head of Israel. And so the word head, Rosh, has a gematria of 501. Also, Ta'amin. The root word is amin. When we say amen, this is, means we believe in something. You shall believe. We need to believe in the head priest, the living Torah. It also has a gematria of 501, as well as a rosh, a, a ras. This is the sin, not the sheen. A ras is the word for betrothal. So when we keep our eyes on the one that we should believe in, the head, of Israel, the high priest and king and Mashiach, we begin to be set apart as a bride without spot or blemish for the betrothal. So there's a lot of hidden beauty even in the gematria of these words, not just a commandment as a rule and restriction, like many people think of commands, you shall command them, and it sounds arbitrary. No, his commandments are not burdensome. His commands are instructions in how to be set apart, how to live a holy life. So keep all of these things in mind as we go through this Torah portion this morning. We start in chapter 27, the last part of it, verse 20. And he says, Ve'ata. Tetzeva et bene Yisrael, all of Tav bene Yisrael. You are to command or order the people, instruct them, the children of Israel, to bring you pure oil of pounded olives for the light, to keep the light burning singular, to keep the light burning continually. This word here is lamp. And we remember God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's interesting that it is singular in this case where you see a parallel in Parsha Emor in Leviticus 24 where he's going through all of these different um, 
laws pertaining to the tabernacle. And we see there in Leviticus 24, he says to keep the lamps, plural, burning. But here he says, keep the lamp. So it's not only the menorah lamp singular, but it's a particular lamp in the seven branch menorah that was the lamp that was the westernmost lamp that was closest to the veil. And remember the veil represents the word who's veiled in human flesh. So this light never went out. It was a miracle. While the other six lights would go out, this one light would be kept burning continually by Hashem. And oil would be placed in the time of the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice by Aaron. But this westernmost lamp never went out until Yeshua was sacrificed. Then they couldn't keep that lamp burning. An amazing miracle. Along with the veil being torn and the thread that was tied around the horns of the scapegoat uh, not turning white on the doors of the tabernacle any longer and the doors not staying shut any longer. There was four major miracles that showed even though they kept the temple service going from 31 AD to 70 AD they were showing that the ultimate Lamb of God had been slain for our sins and that uh, these things no longer meant anything compared to him. Yes, Terrence? Okay. So, let's look at some of the symbolism. Here it is in Hebrew. We have Veata Tetzava et bene Yisrael. Thou shalt command the children of Israel that they shall bring thee pure olive oil beaten for the light. And we know Yeshua was beaten to reveal the light of God's love, to cause the lamp to burn always. So here's an olive orchard that I took Terence and Heather to, and this is in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is where Yeshua spent his last night before he was crucified. And this is where they would come and they would beat the trees, and then when the olive branches would fall heavy laden with the ripe olives, they would beat the olive branches on the ground further, bruising the olives to get the olives to break apart from the branches. Then they would scoop up all the olives and put them in a press. And uh, a lot of times through adversity, we feel beaten, we feel oppressed. And we're going to see much symbolism in that. Here's a close-up of some of these olives, both green and uh, red or, or purple. The olives are first inspected. We know Yeshua was inspected before he... Uh, was crucified just like the lamb is taken on the 10th day of Nisan it's inspected for four days before the 14th of Nisan well the olives are inspected to make sure that they're ripe and ready then the tree is beaten and pounded here's a man with a stick he's beating these olives after he beat the tree and separating the branches from the olives and they're bruised as they're separated from the tree and the tree the olive tree is a symbol of Israel so think about this amazing symbolism with Yeshua being separated from the people of Israel as he is falsely accused and beaten and hung up on a tree for our sins. All because they didn't understand the plan of God's salvation and the word becoming flesh. Then those olives are taken to a press. And this is normally where a donkey is. Well, this is in Nazareth. And on this last trip, we went to Nazareth and we saw some olive presses there. So I'm under the donkey's yoke. And uh, these olives would be placed in this basin and the donkey would go around in a circle and it would crush the olives. And the first pressing is what they would use for this menorah. They would take all of these crushed olives and then put them in this type of almost a wicker uh, baskets that could be compressed or a hemp, a mesh. And they put a rock on it and they would have a long pole with leverage uh, cantilevered over it to press down all of the oil out of the olives. We see much symbolism in this. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree. The olive tree is not only a symbol of Israel, but it's a symbol of Yeshua. Isaiah 53, 4-5 says, Surely he himself bore our griefs and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken. We thought, imagine the view, whenever somebody used to go through hard times, what did Job's friends say to them? 
you must have done something wrong, right? You're smitten by God. So we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. But was he smitten by God? No. We esteemed him afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised and crushed for our iniquities, just like the olive. To press out pure olive oil, we need to be pressed through the trials and tribulations that God allows to come into our life to test our faith. It says the chastising for our well-being fell upon him. And by his example, by his scourgings, by his pressing and overcoming, we are actually healed through that process. And he shows us the way to holiness. Here's an olive, dripping olive oil. Just like Yeshua dripped sweat, which is oil mixed with water and blood. The Hebrew word bruised means crushed. And the crushing and bruising of Yeshua began in the Garden of Gethsemane, which was the very olive orchard where they would take these uh, olives from. And the night before his crucifixion, he was in agony. And his sweat, it says in Luke 22, 44, was as if it was great, it was like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Sweat is oil and water mixed with blood. So we see a lot of symbolism in this. Exodus 27, verse 20 and 21, speaks of this pounded olives to make the oil to keep the light burning continually. And we know his light is burning continually in the heavenly tabernacle as an example for us. And the olive in the olive tree is a symbol of the whole house of Israel. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 11:16. And after the division of Israel in 930 B.C., God referred to his two olive trees. Instead of it being one unified olive tree, the two olive trees is the house of Judah and the house of Israel, the lost sheep, which Yeshua said he came from in all the lands of their dispersion. We see that referred to in Zechariah 4, verse 3 and 11. And Romans, uh, Paul refers to in chapter 11, verse 24, about being grafted in. If God allowed certain branches to be broken off for a time, you who are wild olives, like the lost house of Israel, who lost the Torah and started to look like the pagan cultures in which they lived, if you can be grafted back into the olive tree, how much more could the original uh, branches be grafted in? He says in Romans 11. So part of the good news is sharing with people that whether you're Jew or Gentile or Christian, you can be grafted in to God's bride, Israel. The pounded olives symbolize our refinement and our purity as a bride coming through in our characters due to being pounded in adversity, trials, and tribulations when we are tested as if we will persevere in keeping the commandments of God and holding fast to the testimony of the light of the world, the Word made flesh, Yeshua. It says this in Revelation 12, verse 17 and Revelation 14, 12 as well as uh, Revelation 11:4, It is this allowing of our flesh to be crucified with Christ that purifies the Holy Spirit in us and allows us to shine as a light to the nations continually without wavering, without flickering. Remember, our God is the Father of lights, James says in whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. That means there's not even a shred of darkness. And that's what we have to make sure for our life as we're being recreated in His image is that there's no shred of darkness in us. So here's this menorah that we read about last week in last week's Torah portion. And Exodus 25, 37 says, You shall make the seven lampstands thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they might give light uh, from its face. So what it was lighting was the table of showbread, which represents the Torah. And that's what we do as lights to the world. We represent, or we shine light on both the written Torah, returning to God's Word, and the living Torah, as it's revealed more fully in through Yeshua. Revelation 4, 5 talks about a lampstand in the heavenly tabernacle. It says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne in heaven, which are the seven spirits of God. So this represents 
the seven spirits of God. And we are to know how to live in the sevenfold being of his spirits. Each one of these spirits you can find in Isaiah 11, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the fear of the Lord, and uh, it goes through all seven of them. Did you have Revelation 1.13 says, And in the midst of the candles, the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot. This is the high priestly robes that he's wearing in the heavenly uh, sphere. He is walking in the midst of the seven spirits of God and girt about with a golden girdle. 2 Corinthians 4, 5 says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge. What's the light all about? The knowledge of the glory of God. Now, glory in Greek is doxa. Doxa means character. So literally, us being lights of the world is not just shining a light on the arbitrary head knowledge of memorizing the written word, but seeing God's character. This is why we go through God's character every week. His glory. We're to make known the light of the knowledge of the character of God through the view or display of Yeshua, because he was the ultimate revelation of that character, which is selfless love. So this is what this light is all about. Now, you can't know Yeshua or the Father how to draw near to him without the written word. And this is why we start in the written word. But do you know through the millennium, when Yeshua is teaching as the living Torah, writing the Torah upon our hearts, it's going to become so natural that we are recreated in God's image and we live it out. There'll be no need any longer for the written word. It'll be a natural living of selfless love throughout eternity. Psalms 119 in David says specifically what this light is. Your word is a lamp. And like we said, it's both written and living. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So this represents the Torah in both its forms. The early written Torah and the living Torah in Yeshua. His son Solomon in Proverbs 6.23 says, Your commandments are a lamp. And the Torah is a light. And this is why I correlated the word command. So it's not only the word that's both written and living, but even the command correlates with being a light. Yeshua as the head who we should believe in and be betrothed to. Isaiah 49 verse 6 says, I will make you a light to the nations. So Yeshua didn't do it all for you the way it's often promoted, like you don't have to do anything. He did it all, so just keep sinning the Torah, do away with it. No, he was an example. He showed us what it looks like to live out God's spirit in human flesh so that we could have an example to follow. So this is just a precursor. He's taking us back to how to be purified so that we can draw near to the Father in the most holy place. And this is why God says, I will make you a light to the nations. Otherwise, he would be the only light to the nations and we wouldn't have any part in it. But his desire is to make each one of us a light to the nations after his example. For what purpose? So that his Yeshua, his salvation, can be spread to the ends of the earth. And this is the whole purpose of his disciples going out to the lost sheep of Israel, those who had already been in the diaspora, to every nation, kindred, and tongue, to take the knowledge of salvation, which is Yeshua in Hebrew, to the ends of the earth, so that all of God's bride could begin to be perfected in holiness and purity, in preparation of the marriage of the Lamb. So the word of God came to be a light to the world, as our example. And we see this confirmed in John 8, verse 12. Then spake Yeshua again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows my example shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So how do we follow his example? If he was rejected, despised by men, persecuted, went through trials and tribulations and temptations, but overcame in every area, this is an example for us that we must be overcomers, overcomers of sin in the life. John 3.19 says, This is the condemnation, that the light came into the world, but the men loved the darkness rather than the light, because they were holding on to that selfish nature. That's what it means that their deeds were evil. They weren't willing to relinquish 
their evil deeds, which are stemming from their selfish nature and their wrong identity of needing to feed the flesh instead of feeding the spirit. So we follow Yeshua to the golden candlestick where we are filled with God's spirit of truth, like the olive oil, and shine the light of Torah to the nations. We see in Revelation chapter 1 that the lampstand represents the body of Yeshua around the world. And that's why there were seven different lampstands in um, Revelation, and there's seven different types of messianic bodies. So Revelation chapters 4 and 5 should really be interpreted not as a historist, historic view, as something past, but as something present. It's basically the end-time bride preparing herself, and there's certain things that she's still holding on to darkness with. And this is why God rebukes five out of the seven churches. There's only chur two churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, that do not get rebukes. One is because one is perfected in brotherly love, and the other one is willing to die for the truth, lay down the physical flesh. These two don't receive any rebukes, and it's a good example for us. But other Messianic believers, they're still holding on to a bit of paganism from where they've come out of pagan religions. So he rebukes them. He says, you follow the the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Remember, the Nicolaitans, Nicolaiti, this, there was a false god named Nike, or Nike. This is where we get Nike and St. Nicholas from, and all of these things. And laity is followers of. So he's basically talking about messianic assemblies that are still holding on to elements of paganism in their life. They're not fully come out of Babylon. And so there's certain rebukes through that. Each one of these menorahs, these assemblies of called out believers, he is lovingly admonishing so that they can be purified. They can let go of some of their sins that they're holding on to. Others have the spirit of Jezebel, you'll remember. Others um, do the deeds of Bilaam. Remember all of these rebukes? And we have to ask ourselves, what are these deeds of Bilaam? It's turning the people to curse themselves by leaving God's ways, uh, by embracing different sins, uh, perversities, uh, adulteries, and uh, paganism in the life. Romans 15, 16 says that I should be the minister of Yeshua, the Messiah to the nations, ministering the gospel of God so that the lost house of Israel might be an acceptable offering. Who's to be an offering, the ultimate offering? The lost house of Israel. This is why Paul says, I die daily. We need to be a living sacrifice after his example. Then we can be an acceptable so offering, being sanctified. That means, sanctified means ma being made holy by the Holy Spirit. This is the only way we're ever going to be able to be at one with the Father, is if we go through this process of dying to the self, being an acceptable offering, and being sanctified through the Spirit of God, the study of Torah and through prayer, which the three pieces of furniture in the holy place represent that sanctifying process. So what does the sanctification of the spirit of truth look like in God's people? John 17, 17 says, Father, sanctify them in thy truth. So we're sanctified through the knowledge of truth. Thy word is truth. And the spirit of truth will lead God's people into all truth. So when people say that they're full of the Holy Spirit and yet they're rejecting God's truth and his Torah, is it the spirit of God or is it a spirit of emotionalism or is it a, spirit, a false spirit? We have to ask ourselves because his spirit sanctifies us in the truth. Revelation 14 says, here is the perseverance or the patience or the diligence of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, for he that is joined to Hashem is one spirit. By what? Pureness, just like this pure olive oil. There can't be any contaminants left in us after the sanctifying process. Otherwise, we will not be able to enter the most holy place, which we enter into one day a year on the Day of Atonement, which represents total at one minute with the Father. It's been there, isn't it? What's that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Good catch. Everything is symbolized in perfection is symbolized by sevens. So we have the seven spirits of God, and we have here the description of how we are joined to God through his one spirit by pureness, 
by knowledge. Remember, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. By long suffering, this is that perseverance that we're talking about that presses us. Welcome, brother. By kindness, by the Holy Spirit, see how it's all leading up to his character of love unfeigned, and by the word of truth. So, now, let's go into chapter 28, and we're going to see how it parallels the coverings of the tabernacle that we read about in the middle of last week's Torah portion, chapter 26, in the coverings of the Mikdash. You are to summon your brother Aharon and his sons to come from among the people of Israel to you, so that they can serve me as a Kohanim. So, what are the people of Israel to serve God as? Priest. This is the original covenant. So this is a covenant that they broke by worshiping the golden calf. And only the Levites did not bow the knee to the golden calf. And this is why Levi temporarily became the priest. But God desires to restore and renew the original covenant and make all of us a type of first fruits of Israel. A priest, he says, know ye not that you will be a kingdom of priests in the millennial kingdom? And so we have to wear these garments symbolically. This is what Paul was talking about when he says, put on the armor of God daily. It's not the armor of a Roman soldier, a pagan Roman soldier. It's the coverings of the high priest that we have to mentally put on. Remember the helmet of salvation. We gird our, belt, our waist with the belt of truth. Well, our sword is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We have a breastplate of righteousness, and our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel. All of these are symbols of the high priestly garments, which we're going to see here. Aaron and his sons, Nadav, Avihu, Elazar, and Itamar, these are to be the priests. You are to make for your brother Aaron garments. And what does garments represent? Garments are symbolic of character. So when Yeshua says, buy from me gold tried in the fire and white raiment, that white raiment is what the priest would wear. The regular priest, there was many priests officiating. There was one high priest, right? All the other priests wore white. The high priest had the ephod and the blue garments and the turban and the mitre and the golden sash. And so when he says, buy from me gold tried in the fire, that's our characters being refined through adversity, through the fire of adversity, trials and tribulations. The dross in our character is burnt away. And then he says, and white raiment. This is the white raiment of the priest because we're to be a part of the priesthood. You are to make for your brother Aaron garments representing God's character, set apart, Kodesh, holy, for serving God, expressing dignity. This is in Hebrew, kavod, which means glory. Once again, a connotation of his character and splendor. Speak to all the craftsmen who are wise at heart. God gave certain giftings to these men to know how to build these different pieces of furniture within the tabernacle. In the Hebrew, it has a connotation of being wise at heart. Who he gave the spirit of wisdom to. And have them make Aaron's garments to set him apart, to kodesh him, make him holy for God, to serve God in his holy tabernacle in the office of Cohen Hagadol, high priest. The garments they are to make are these. And now we see the armor of God listed, a breastplate, which Paul says, wear the armor of God daily, put on the breastplate of righteousness. And then we see this ritual vest representing the shield of faith and a robe representing righteousness. All of this you can find in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, 14, the armor of God. The tunic and the turban is the helmet of salvation. Literally, on this turban was a golden mitre that said, Kodesh le Adonai, holy to the Lord. That's placed over the mind, every thought, is to be holy to the Lord. Then our speech and our actions are going to naturally be holy if our thoughts are holy and centered on Him. So, very symbolic turban of salvation. And what is salvation? When Paul says, put on the helmet of salvation, what's the Hebrew word for salvation? 
Yeshua. So we're literally seeing God through the lens of Yeshua daily, keeping our eyes on Him. And a sash. A sash was this golden belt that, um, or in the case of the regular priest, it would be blue mixed with red and crimson that Paul refers to as the belt of truth. They are to make holy garments for your brother Aaron and his sons so that he can serve me in the office of Cohen. They are to use gold, which represents our character, blue, which represents the commandments, crimson, which represents the blood of the ultimate sacrifice shed for us. And when you have, like John saw in vision, a people who are keeping both the commandments of God, blue, and having the testimony in Yeshua, the ultimate sacrifice, crimson, and you mix those two together, you get a royal priesthood. And that's exactly what he called us. And what's the color of royalty? Blue mixed with crimson, purple. And that's the third element here. Blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine white pure linen. We see all of these reflected in Revelation 19 verse 8 where Yeshua is wearing the linen robe and the gold. They are to make the ritual vest of gold of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and a finely woven linen crafted by a skilled artesian. Attached to its front and back edges are to be two shoulder pieces that can be fastened together. On these shoulder pieces had all the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So literally the high priest is bearing the names of the whole house of Israel on his shoulders, representing bearing their burdens, always thinking about them. Its decorated belt is to be of the same workmanship and materials, gold, blue, purple, scarlet yarn, and finely woven linen. Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of the names are going to be on one stone on one side and six remaining names on the other in the order of their birth. An engraver should engrave the names of the sons of Israel on the two stones as he would engrave a seal. Amazing. How do you engrave a seal? You either have a relief, which means the image is coming out, or you engrave deeply, which means it's set in. So it'll be interesting to see whether the names of Israel are raised up or whether they're engraved deeply in. Mount the stones in gold settings and put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the vest as stones calling to mind the sons of Israel. So if we have a high priest who's touched with the feeling of our infirmities in the heavenly sanctuary and he's wearing the high priestly garments, guess what? He is calling to mind the sons of Israel daily by wearing these. That's beautiful because that includes you and me. That means he's interceding on our behalf and calling to mind not only our original forefathers, but all of their children and descendants in the diaspora afterwards to our day. Aaron is to carry their names before Adonai on his two shoulders as a reminder. Aaron is just a type of the ultimate high priest, Yeshua. And it's interesting that when these 12 names would be inscribed or engraved on these two onyx stones, six on each side, the total number of Hebrew letters, when you take from Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, all the way down to Joseph and Benjamin, there was 50 Hebrew letters. And 50 is very symbolic, just like 50 days that we count from Passover, from the sacrifice to Shavuot, when the Holy Spirit came and descended upon the disciples, or the 50 days that from the deliverance from Egypt to God betrothing his betrothed bride in covenant at Mount Sinai and giving her the Ketubah covenant in the Torah. Make gold squares and two chains of pure gold like twisted cords. Attach the cord-like chains to the squares. So, another interesting thing that comes to mind is when you count from Reuben's, from the Reish of Reuben all the way down, those 50 letters, guess what? Joseph's name, who Yeshua was a type of Mashiach bin Yosef in his first coming, right? And Yeshua is spelled with the little Yod that Yosef is spelled with, and also Yitzhak, who was a type of Yeshua. The Yod is the smallest of all the Hebrew letters because it is reflecting God's selfless nature. So it doesn't need to be big. It makes itself small. He who came from heaven lowered himself to the lowest place, the Word of God. Well, the very 
41st letter is the Yod. And it was on the 41st day that Yeshua ascended back into heaven. And so interesting that Yeshua would be reflected at even in the Yod on his shoulders for the name of Yosef, the 41st letter for Messiah bin Yosef. He says to make a breastplate for judgment for the Mishpat team, for the righteously dividing the word to Israel. This is why it's called a breastplate of righteousness. Have it crafted by a skilled artesian. What's interesting is that justice, when you're judging, you're performing a work of justice, uh, making sure that justice is given both to the poor and to the rich, to the innocent and to the guilty. And the word for righteousness and the word for justice in Hebrew are the exact same word, which is zedik. This is the word for justice, very similar to zadik, which is a righteous person. So here, this breastplate of zedik, of righteousness, was for performing zedik, justice. And it is to be crafted by a skilled artesian like the work of the ritual vest, uh, made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely woven linen. When folded double, it is to be square, a hand span by a hand span. Put on it settings of stone, four rows of stones. The first row is to be a carnelian, then a topaz, and an emerald. So a man's hand span, usually a span in ancient times was three inches. So this little ephod, three inches by three inches. A lot of times we see it really big across the chest, but here we see that it's a hand span by a hand span. And it has a carnelian, a topaz, and an emerald on the top. And then the second row has a green feldspar stone, and then a sapphire right in the middle, representing the very stone that the commandments of God was uh, wrote uh, his finger with. And then a diamond and then on the third row orange zircon and then agate and then amethyst and then the fourth row beryl and then black onyx and then jasper which is usually red but comes in different colors and each one of these stones would represent a different tribe of israel and they were to be mounted in gold sockets the stones would correspond to the names of the 12 sons of Israel. They were to be engraved with their names as a seal would be engraved to represent the 12 tribes. So he's got the 12 tribes on his shoulders and two black conic stone. And each one of these 12 stones on the ephod would have a name of the son of Israel inscribed upon it. So this means literally he's bearing our burdens and, as our intercessor and he's carrying us over his heart, which is beautiful in the heavenly sphere. On the breastplate, make two gold chains like twisted cords coming down for the breastplate. Make two gold rings and put the gold rings on the two ends of the breastplate. Put the two twisted gold chains in the two rings at the two ends of the breastplate. Attach the other two ends of the twisted chains to the front of the shoulder pieces of the ritual vest. Make two gold rings and put them on the two ends of the breastplate at its edge on the side facing toward the vest. Also make two gold rings and attach them low on the front part so that way the ephod didn't swing out on the front part of the vest shoulder pieces near the, the joint above the vest decorated belt. Then bind the breastplate with its rings to the rings of the vest with a blue cord so that it can be on the vest decorated belt and so that the breastplate won't swing loose from the vest. Aaron, as the high priest, will carry the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate for judging over his heart when he enters the holy place. There's a double witness confirmation. As a continual reminder before Adonai, you are to put the Urim and the Tumen in the breastplate for judging. They will be over Aaron's heart when he goes into the presence of the Lord. So this Urim and Tumen would tell the high priest how to decide certain matters. One would light up if it was affirmative, or the other one would uh, light up if it was negative. Thus, Aaron will always have the means for making decisions for the people of Israel over his heart when he is in the presence of Adonai. You are to make a robe for the ritual vest entirely of blue. It is to have an opening for the head in the middle. Now remember, the covering over the Ark of the Covenant was a blue garment. 
the priest gets covered, the high priest gets covered in a blue garment, representing he's fully covered by the commandments of God. So we carry a little blue in our tzitzit to remind us to keep the commandments, but imagine fully wearing that blue, how much your focus would be on every aspect of God's character as revealed through the Ten Commandments. It is to have an opening for the head in the middle, and around its opening is to be a border woven like the neck of a coat of mail so that it won't tear. On its bottom hem, make pomegranates. So they would have a pomegranate of blue, and then of purple, and of scarlet, and they would be alternated by little golden bells around the hem of the priestly garment, all the way around. A gold bell and a pomegranate, a gold bell and a pomegranate, all the way around the hem of the robe. Aaron is to wear it when he ministers, and its sound will be heard when he enters the holy place before Adonai, and when he leaves, so that he won't die. So it's as if he's telling the Spirit of God in advance, who's dwelling there over the Ark of the Covenant, I'm coming into the holy place. I'm just on the other side of the veil. And if it's the Day of Atonement, then he has to enter through that veil with a censer to even create more of a veil of cloud around the glory of God, which is that Shekinah glory, the feminine essence of God, which we know our God is so pure that his, the light of his love is like a consuming fire to anyone who's harboring any darkness and goes into his presence. This is why God gave very strict instructions on how to make yourself holy and sanctified and pure to be able to draw near to him. So it's a process that is taken since this time and will ultimately be perfected in the millennial kingdom. Then sin and death can finally be destroyed and we can be at one with the Father after being purified and made holy perfectly. But there's a process that we have to follow. In each one of these, we see symbolizing the ultimate revelation of that process in Yeshua. So he says, you're to make, we're in verse 36, to make ornaments. And this word for ornament in the Hebrew is zitz, the same root as the zitzit that we call the tassels, which remind us of the commandments of God. You're to make a little zit of pure gold and engrave on it as a, a seal set apart for Adonai. This zitz is the name of the um, golden uh, miter. It would be like a crown. So this is representing that the high priest is not only officiating in a righteous, pure priestly manner in the temple, but the golden crown represents that the ultimate high priest is also going to be king. Yeshua will reign as both high priest and king in the millennial temple. Fastened to the turban, a cord of blue. And on the front of the turban, remember it said, set apart for Adonai, Kodesh Le Adonai, would be over Aaron's forehead. And this is what's over Yeshua's forehead. He's set apart for Adonai, for God. Because the high priest bears the guilt for any errors committed by the people of Israel in consecrating their holy gifts. This ornament is always to be on his forehead so that the gifts for Adonai will be accepted by him. You are to weave the checkered tunic of fine linen, make a turban of fine linen, and make a belt, the work of a weaver in colors. Likewise, for Aaron's sons, make tunics, sashes, and headgear, expressing dignity and splendor. With them, clothe your brother Aaron and his sons, then anoint them and inaugurate them and consecrate them so that they will be able to serve me in the office of Cohen, which is priest. Also make them linen shorts, reaching from waist to thigh. So even God did not want the ground to be desecrated by having a view of their private parts. He had taught a element of purity in even covering your loin with these inner um, linen garments. They were like linen underwear, if you will. And this is what, when they were dirty and used, would get shredded up and used as wicks in the menorah, representing that the Spirit of God can flow through fallen man. The gold, of course, was pure, but the, the wicks were the used linen garments of the priest representing the beauty of how the Spirit can still make us lights to the world. So he says, 
make for them linen shorts reaching from waist to thigh to cover their bare flesh. Aaron and his sons are to wear them when they go into the tent of meeting and when they approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they won't incur guilt and die. This is to be a perpetual regulation, both him and for his descendants. So let's look at some of the symbolism of these coverings now. You see the high priest here, and he's got the blue vest over the linen tunic. White represents purity. Blue represents the commandments of God. Gold represents pure character. And the two stones on his shoulders and the 12 stones in his breastplate both represent the 12 tribes of Israel with them engraved upon it. You have Kodesh uh, set apart to Adonai on the miter and the turban. This represents the helmet of salvation. You've got the breastplate of righteousness. You've got the belt of truth, the sash. And the feet, humility. They weren't even wearing any shoes into the holy place. And this represents us in humility, taking the gospel of God's selfless love as seen in Yeshua to the world. We have to deny our flesh. We can't build up our treasures here on this earth, right? Our treasure is in heaven when we dedicate our lives to taking the gospel. This is why Paul says, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel, which their feet weren't shod with anything, which means we need to be totally devoid of self and self-protectionism. And here's a regular priest, one of the sons of Aaron. Only the sons of Aaron could be priest. So Aaron was from the tribe of Levi. Moses was too. And every priest was a Levite, but not every Levite was a priest because Levi had many sons and only the sons of Aaron could be the priest. So we see different garments uh, and their symbolism here. And we think of Yeshua as our intercessor and high priest in the heavenly sphere, bearing the names of the children of Israel, just like Aaron did, on his heart with the breastplate of judgment and on his shoulders before the Lord during this time before his return for the bride. He's interceding for our sins. Zechariah 3 Verses 1 through 8 says, And he showed me Yehoshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Hasatan standing at his right side to resist him. Why is he resisting him? Because Yehoshua is interceding for all the saints, while Hasatan is accusing you day and night before the Lord, saying, That person's worthy of death. That person's worthy of death because of their sin, because of their error. And Yeshua is saying, I'm bearing their sin. I took the effects of their um, sin, which is the second death. And so it's like this little uh, judgment before the judgment seat. That's why literally the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the very throne room of God in the heavenly sphere, is called the mercy seat. It's also called the seat of judgment because judgment is going on for all the 12, 12 tribes of Israel and those who are grafted in. And yet Hasatan is seeking to judge us, to accuse us day and night. But God is showing us mercy because of Yeshua. It says, and that's because of his nature as well. Yeshua is just revealing his nature and his sacrifice. The Lord says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Even the Lord who has chose Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? So every person who is destined to be in the flames of destruction through their sins is plucked out and saved. And so he's claiming each one of us as he's bearing our names on his shoulders and over his heart. Now Yehoshua was clothed in filthy garments. Why? In this vision that Zechariah had, this is a vision of Yeshua who had taken our sins upon himself. This garments, remember, represent character and all of our fallen character from Adam. And he stood before the angel, and he answered and spake unto those that should be before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him, because he had not sinned in one iota. So these are not going to be attributed against him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I'm going to clothe you with a change of raiment. I'm going to reveal your pure character, which is really yours. And I said, Let them set a fair miter upon his head. This is the mitre that says, Holy to the Lord. 
See, his character is pure, and every thought is pure. So he gets the mitre of the high priest. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with new garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by, and the angel of the Lord entreated Yehoshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my charge, then you shall also judge my house, and you shall also keep my courts, and I will give you places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Yehoshua, the high priest, you and your fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. So there was actually a high priest in ancient times named Jehoshua. And God prophesied through the prophet Zechariah that this is a type of the coming branch who would branch out from the root of Jesse, who would reign on the throne of David, and who would be a high priest, the ultimate high priest. So we see a literal person symbolizing the type and anti-type in Yeshua. Hebrews 9.11 says, But Messiah has become a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more, ta more perfect tabernacle in heaven, not made with human hands. So imagine Yeshua right now in the very throne room of God, officiating as our high priest, bearing our sins upon his shoulders, but being recognized as the one who did not sin. And so that filthy raiment, all those sins that he carried from this earth to the most holy place, is being taken away. And this is what's represented by him receiving new garments. Hebrews 6.20 says, Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Yehoshua made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Yeshua is order, after the order of Melchizedek, not only spiritually, but literally. And Melchizedek is a higher order of priesthood because it precedes the Levitical priesthood. And the Levites were in the loins of Abraham when he was paying a tithe to Melchizedek, recognizing him as the ultimate priest. Well, do you know that Judah, when he went to get a wife for his sons, and he went to the most holy place he could find to kind of um, rectify the problem that he had done in marrying a Canaanite. So Judah, in marrying a Canaanite, could not have the promised offspring that was to rule with a rod of iron. So he was hoping that by getting a daughter from the most holy house, the house of Melchizedek, granddaughter Tamar, that his sons could at least produce this offspring. But his sons were the offspring of a Canaanite. So God saw fit that neither one of them could consummate the marriage with Tamar. And Tamar was sent back to her father's house, and later Judah was with her, not knowing who it was, and had two sons, impregnated her, and Zerah, the one with the scarlet thread, which today is represented by the scarlet line, and Jude, uh, Perez, which is represented by the golden line in heraldry, both lines of Judah's offspring had the scepter throughout all of those years. There was kings that arose from them. And the ultimate king, Yeshua, came from the line of Perez. So we see that he's actually, his great, 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 great grandmother was actually the granddaughter of Melchizedek, who was Shem. And so he literally is of the order of Melchizedek and reigns as the high priest in heaven of that order. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Yehoshua, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Having come in human flesh, the Word knows what it's like to be tried and tempted, and to be born into hereditary sins of the forefathers and tendencies. Imagine in his lineage through David and through Rahab, I mean, he's got prostitution, he's got through Lot. Remember the Moabite um, which Ruth came from was incest. David was a murderer. Um, we have every different type of sin that we could be tempted with. He over, even overcame diet just like Adam failed you know, in taking from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In every way we have a high priest who's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But in every point that he was tempted he overcame. He never fell into sin in one iota. It's not a sin to be tempted. 
It's a sin when you hold on to that temptation and you cherish it in the mind. Anything that's cherished in the mind will end up giving birth. Just like any seed, when planted, ends up giving birth if it gets watered. That's what happens when you get tempted. You need to rebuke it, just like you rebuke Satan. The Lord rebuke you, Hasatan. Depart from me. Otherwise, if we hold on to it, we're going to end up giving into it. But Yeshua, he was a great example that even though he was tempted, he never sinned, which means he never acted selfishly in one iota, because sin is literally self-seeking. Remember in John 1, 1 John 3, 4, it says, sin is the transgression of the Torah. And the Torah is the transcript of God's selfless love. So literally, in essence, sin is everything that's self-seeking and that stems from the self and from the flesh. We have the promise that we will be a kingdom of priests when Yeshua returns. Exodus 19, the original covenant, says that God intended for all of Israel to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Isaiah 61, 6 says, But you shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you from call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. So what's their glory? And what is boasting? If we're not supposed to have any self, what kind of boasting is this talking about? Remember, glory means character, right? If by our being a holy light to the nations helps them purify their lives and return to Torah and be grafted into the bride, Israel, then literally we can boast in their characters being perfected in Yeshua. That's something good. That's selfless. We're not boasting because of something in us. We're boasting because of the joy of seeing how our light has even helped the nations be purified and be able to draw near to the Lord. This is what it means to be a priest, and we are to start living that priestly mentality here and now. Don't waste for the millennial kingdom. So now, in chapter 29, we're going to see a process of cleansing the high priest. Now that he's got these garments, before he can put these garments on, he needs to be cleansed. And we're going to liken this to the laver. Before you could enter the holy place, there was a laver of water that you would wash with. And do you know that the Pharisees, the root word of the word Pharisee is parushim. Now, a parushim comes from the word just like parusha, parush. Parush means to be set apart. They were trying to hold on long after the, the true priestly lineage of the, um, the Zadok lineage of the priesthood was done away with by the Greeks. These were a righteous people who were seeking to hold on to the instructions that God gave the priest, even though there was no longer a temple, there was no longer a priesthood. And so the Purushim, they called themselves the set apart ones, and they started practicing all the rituals of the priest. And this is why they would wash the hands. It's not a bad thing to wash the hands. It represents the cleansing that the priest would go through before they entered the temple. The only reason Yeshua rebuked them in Matthew 13 is that, I think it's 13, Matthew 13 or 15, is that um, they were so focused on the outside projection of cleanliness and purity and holiness while holding on to darkness and selfishness inside. So he called them whitewashed tombs because they cleaned up and continued to look like priests on the outside and set apart people, but they're secretly holding on to sins of greediness, of sexual immorality, of any kind of selfishness that you can think of. I'm sure different people were dealing with different things, so he was calling them out. If you really want to be a Purushim, which is not a bad thing, it's good to be a Pharisee. We want to be a set apart like a priest, but the most important thing is to be pure within first. Then that inward purity will manifest in outward purity. Purity of thought, purity of word, purity of deed. So we see that this washing of hands originated from these very instructions in cleansing and anointing of the priest and the laver. Chapter 29, verse 1 says, Here is what you are to do to consecrate them for ministry to me in the office of Cohen. Take one young bull and two rams without defect. Also matzah and matzah cakes mixed with olive oil. Now a bull always represents a sin offering for a leader, a ruler, or a nation. And matzah is bread cooked without leaven. So you're atoning for the leaders in this cleansing process, and you're representing that these leaders should not have any sin. This is why the matzah also re represents Yeshua at the time of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
mixed with olive oil representing the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So this matzah, the sinless wafer, symbolized, spread with the Holy Spirit, made with fine wheat flour, which we are to be the wheat harvest, we're represented by the wheat at Shavuot time, put them together in a basket and present them in the basket along with the bull and the two rams. So, so much symbolism in everything. Bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Take the garments, this is, they would be washed from this laver that you see here. Take the garments and then put on the garments on Aaron after he's been washed, along with the tunic and then the robe for the ritual vest. So interesting, you wash him first, which the New Testament says our conscience is cleansed by the blood of the lamb, the consciousness to sin we are cleansed from. Then, when, before we have a totally new character, what's the very first thing that was put on the priest? He's standing there naked. He's totally washed, right? Just like our conscience is washed, representing no negativity uh, towards your fellow man, no Lashon Hara, no remembrance of sin in your own life, no remembrance of sin in Israel's life. You're totally purified. And the very first thing that's put on, look right here, in verse, the end of verse 7, is the turban. And then verse 5 also, take the garments, but before you put them on, put the, tu put the, uh, put on Aaron the tunic, the robe for the ritual vest, the vest itself, and the breastplate. Fasten the vest on him with its belt, then put the turban on his head and attach the holy ornament to the turban. So the very last thing was this mitre that says holy to the Lord put on. All of these vestitures are representing different aspects of character of purity in the character. Then take the anointing oil and anoint him by pouring it on his head. Bring his sons, put tunics on them, wrap sashes around them, Aaron and his sons, and put the headgear on their heads. The office of priest is to be theirs by a permanent regulation. Thus you will consecrate Aaron and his sons. Bring the young bull to the front of the meeting. Aaron and his sons are to lay their hands on the bull's head, and you're to slaughter the bull in the presence of Adonai at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So when it says the office of Cohen is to be a permanent regulation, we know that even in the millennial kingdom, while Yeshua is reigning as the order of Melchizedek as high priest, he will have Levitical priest also officiating and doing different aspects of the temple's work. And to this day, you can track who is of the tribe of Levi by their last name, like the name Cohen, very popular Jewish name. This is Cohen stemming from the, the Hebrew name for priest. Also Levi. Remember, you can tell somebody's a Levite because they might be Levites in their last name or Levi. Or, so there's different ways that you can trace the tribes of Israel and specifically the Levites. And, but the sons of Aaron would be called Cohen. And they will be doing a certain work in the temple during the millennium. Take some of the bull's blood and put it on the horns of the altar to purify it. Pour out all the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. Take all the fat that covers the inner organs, the covering of the liver and the two kidneys with their fat, and offer them up in smoke on the altar. But the bull's flesh, skin, and dung you are to destroy by fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. Take one of the rams, Aaron and his sons, to lay their hands on the ram's head, and you are to slaughter the ram and take its blood and splash it on all sides of the altar. Now we're going to see this bull and this ram offering also in the Hoff Torah in Ezekiel, in the Hoff Torah portion. Quarter the ram, wash the inner organs and the lower parts of the legs, and put them with the quarters on the head. I mean, and the head. Then offer up the whole ram in smoke on the altar. It is a burnt offering for Adonai, a pleasing aroma, an offering made to Adonai by fire. So. The bulls would represent the corporate nation, nation of Israel. There's also on Sukkot, uh, 70 bulls that are sacrificed over the seven days that are atoning uh, sin offering for the nations. The goat or the ram would be a type of purification for the leaders and for the people. 
And we see that this blood of this ram would be placed on these leaders, on Aaron and on his sons. In verse 19, it would be, some of the blood would be put on his right earlobe and on his right thumb and on his right big toe. The rest of the blood would be splashed on the side of the altar and on its horns. Then they would take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and they would sprinkle it on Aaron and his clothing. Usually sprinkling of blood symbolized the covenant being ratified. And on his sons and on the clothing of his sons with him so that he and his clothing will be consecrated, set apart for only holy use. And with him his sons and his sons clothing. Also take the fat from the ram, the fat tail, the fat that covers the inner organs, the two kidneys, the fat covering them, and the right thigh, for it is a ram of consecration, along with a loaf of bread, a cake of oiled bread with one wafer from the basket of matzah, which is before Adonai, and put them all in the hands of Aaron and his sons. So they would have to be holding these things as Moses is doing this. They are to wave them as a wave offering in the presence of Adonai, then take them back and burn them up in smoke on the altar, on top of the burnt offering, to be a pleasing aroma before the Lord. It is an offering made to Adonai by fire. You're to take the breast of the ram for Aaron's consecration and wave it as a wave offering before Adonai. This will be your share. Consecrate the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of any contribution that has been waved and raised up, whether from the ram of consecration or from anything else meant for Aaron and his sons. These parts of the offering would be given to Aaron and to the priest to eat. Because remember, they're not working out in the fields. They're not hunting. They are not taking care of flocks. They're totally doing the Lord's work. And so the people had to take care of them. And part of the offering to the Lord would be for their consumption. This is to be a perpetual statue. This will belong to Aaron and his sons as their share perpetually due to their due from the people of Israel. It will be a contribution from the people of Israel for their peace offerings and their contributions to Ad Adonai. The holy garments of Adonai will be used by his sons after him. They will be anointed. Now remember who became high priest when Aaron died? Nadav and Avihu ended up dying by bringing strange fire into the temple. And so this fell on Eliezer to continue the high priestly ministry. So these garments were passed on to him. Then it says, The son who becomes Cohen in his place, who comes into the tent of meeting to serve in the holy place, is to wear them for seven days. This consecration took place over a whole week. Just like Moshe was up on the top of Mount Sinai for six days before the Lord spoke on the seventh day. There's a process, a cycle of seven representing purity and perfection of consecration. They are to take the ram of consecration and boil its meat in a holy place. Aaron and his sons will eat the ram's meat and the bread in the basket at the entrance to the tent of meeting. They are to eat the things which atonement was made for them, to inaugurate and consecrate them. No one else may eat this food because it is holy. If any of the meat for the consecration or any of the bread remains until morning, burn up what remains. It is not to be eaten because it is holy. Carry out all of these orders I have given you concerning Aaron and his sons. You are to spend seven days consecrating them. And it's a symbol of man being consecrated, being sanctified over the last 7,000 years. You know, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. And so there's been a process for this earth since sin has entered in in the Garden of Eden of seven symbolic days to the Lord. And we're about to enter into the seventh day, the millennial Shabbat, in which this work of sanctification will be completed through Yeshua, the living Torah, writing Torah upon our hearts in fulfillment of the new covenant described in Jeremiah 31, which is that God will write his Torah upon our hearts. He will give us a new heart and we will be able to live out Torah naturally and be consecrated and spend eternity with God forever after. So each day a young bull was to be offered as a sin offering besides other offerings of atonement. They would offer a sin offering on the altar 
as for their atonement, then anoint it to consecrate it. He said, seven days you will make atonement on the altar and consecrate it. Thus the altar will be especially holy, and whatever touches the altar will become holy. Now this is what you are to offer on the altar. Two lambs, a year old, regularly, every day. So this is the origins of the morning and the evening sacrifices. Remember when Daniel says, unto 2,300 evening and mornings, because the day begins in the evening, uh, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed? Well, who had desecrated the temple? Antiochus the fourth, And so God was revealing through the prophet Daniel how long the temple would remain desecrated. And since there's two offerings every day, the evening offering of the lamb and the morning offering of the lamb, which has since been replaced when the temple was destroyed, we replaced those with an offering of prayer. And this is why we have so much liturgy in Judaism. But the prayer ascends like a fragrant aroma, just like the offerings of old. But this was a clue to Daniel. Only with a Hebrew mind could you understand. It wasn't 2,300 days that the sanctuary would be cleansed. It was 2,300 evening and morning sacrifices. And since there was two a day, you would have to divide that in half, and you would have 1,150 days. And that's exactly the number of days from the time that Antiochus uh, desecrated it with setting up uh, altar to Zeus and uh, sacrificed a pig on the altar to the time when the Maccabees could reconsecrate and make holy and cleanse the the altar 1150 days 12 2300 evening and morning sacrifices and this is why Daniel would pray in the morning he's in Babylon remember and the temple has been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the people noticed that every morning at the time of the morning sacrifice and every evening he would be praying and also David writes in Psalms that at high noon uh, we he, is, he praises the Lord. So Daniel incorporated this into his practice. The time of the morning sacrifice, high noon, and the evening. And this is why the princes of Persia said, we know one thing about this man. He prays three times a day faithfully. He would be saying the standing prayer. So one lamb in the morning, the other lamb at dusk. With the one lamb, offer two quarts of finely ground flour mixed with one quart of oil from pressed olives along with one quart of wine as a drink offering. The other lamb you are to offer at dusk. So this, these two lambs are representing two different things with the things that are being offered with them. The olive oil represents the Lamb of God being full of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And the drink offering, the wine, is a symbol of the blood that ratifies the covenant. And His blood ratified the covenant, renewing the original covenant of God with man, making us a kingdom of priests once again. This was all hinted at in these sacrifices. Interesting, too, that you see two different offerings because Yeshua is seen in, in His first coming, and then He's also seen in His second coming, two different comings. It's as if two different lambs. And the Jewish mindset believed that there would be two different messiahs, a suffering servant, Mashiach ben Yosef, and a king and high priest, Mashiach ben David. And they didn't realize it would be the same person, the Word of God. The other lamb that you offer at dusk, do with it as you do with the morning one, with the grain and the drink offerings. It will be a pleasing aroma, an offering made to Adonai by fire. Through all your generations, this is to be the regular burnt offering at the entrance to the tent of meeting before Adonai. This is where I will meet you to speak with you. There I will meet with the people of Israel, and I will place, and the place where I will, where you will be consecrated by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Likewise, I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me in the office of Cohen. Then I will live with the people of Israel and be their God, and they will know that I, Adonai, their God, am the one who brought them out from the land of Egypt in order to live with them. I am Adonai, their God. So his whole plan and purpose is to live with us, to dwell in us. And Yeshua, what's beautiful about all of these 
things that will be taught once the temple is rebuilt during the thousand year millennial reign during the messianic age is all of these things are to teach us the symbols that we have missed throughout the ages that point to him as the spotless lamb of God and that reveal God's character and how to be sanctified and consecrated so that God can dwell with us and in us once again. That's the whole plan or purpose of the plan of salvation. So let's look at this process of cleansing in the symbolism of the labor. <clears throat> we see John 4.10 says, Yehoshua answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God, who's the gift of God? Yeshua. Remember John 3.16, the gift of God. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to thee, give me to drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. This is what we want and this is what we're going to see flow from the, the temple in the millennial kingdom. Both to the eastern sea and to the western sea, Ezekiel says. John 7, 37 says, In the last days, that great day of the feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, which symbolizes Messiah tabernacling with man, Yeshua stood and cried, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. So what Yeshua was quoting here was the fulfillment of Isaiah 55, which was pertaining to himself, which talks about living waters. And we have a song that we teach our children from the young days called Maim Kaim, means fountains of living water. And this is looking forward to that millennial kingdom. The brazen altar represents the altar of sacrifice. This is the very first thing that you would see when you come into the outer court. And it's just like a person in their spiritual walk. The very first thing that really woos them to return to God is the sacrifice that you see through Yeshua, that selfless love. Exodus 12.5 says, Your lamb should be without blemish. And Yeshua was without blemish. John 10, 11 says he's not only the lamb, but he's also the shepherd. Everything, just like he's not only the sacrifice, but he's also the high priest making the sacrifice. Everything symbolizes him. He said, I'm the good shepherd, the good shepherd that gives his life for the sheep. So what does this tell us about our sacrifice of praise and prayer? We need to be like him in being willing to lay down our life for the sheep. And who are the sheep? the lost house of Israel around the world. So should we be building things up for ourselves? Building our kingdom on this earth? Or should we be giving all and in our own way dying to self to allow God to use us to reach out? Because there's still many of the lost house of Israel who don't know their true identity. And they don't know what their divine calling is, their purpose, and their divine destiny. So it's such a joy to be called to this work, like Yeshua was, for the lost house of Israel. But it takes sacrifice, self-denial, dying to self daily. The altar of incense is what we look at in the last couple of verses. Uh, chapter 30, we only look at verse 10. And we're going to see this paralleled in our Hoftor portion in Ezekiel with we moved from the altar of sacrifice to the altar of incense and then back to the altar of sacrifice. Chapter 30 says about the altar of incense, you are to make an altar on which to burn incense. Now this incense would arise like a fragrant aroma before the veil and it represents our prayers which are a very big part of the sanctifying process. Remember the menorah is one aspect which is allowing the spirit to flow through us. The table of showbread represents the Torah and the 12 tribes of Israel being grafted into them because there was 12 loaves and the altar of incense is our prayers. Make of it acacia wood. It is to be 18 inches square and three feet high. Its horns are to be of one piece with it. Overlay it with pure gold, its tops and its sides and its horns, and put around the top of it a molding of gold, just like it, each piece had its own crown. Make two gold rings for it underneath the molding at the corners on both sides. This is where the carrying poles will go. Make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Place it in front of the curtain by the ark for the testimony. So the only thing that was separating the ark of the covenant and this altar of incense was the veil. In front of the ark cover, that is over the testimony where I will meet with you, Aaron will burn fragrant incense on it as a pleasing aroma every morning. He is to burn it when he prepares the lamps. 
So this would be ignited the same time of the morning sacrifice, he's going in and trimming the wicks of the menorah, putting more oil in, and laying more incense on the altar of incense. Aaron is to also burn it when he lights the lamps at dusk, so morning and evening. This is a regular burning of incense before Adonai. So what does this tell you about your prayer life? This is the origins of why you pray in the morning and why you pray before you go to bed. This is a regular burning of incense before Adonai throughout all your generations. And when the temple was destroyed, the Jews replaced the sacrificial system, largely in part, with prayer. And at these timings, they would pray, and they had very specific prayers that they would pray during these times, like the Amidah, the standing prayer, or the Shimoni Ezra, the benediction of 18 different points that, you know, sometimes when we're just praying, uh, off the cuff or in a hurried manner, we forget the depth of different aspects of prayer and the things that we should be praying for and interceding on behalf of the whole house of Israel. But this Shimoni Ezra, this benediction of 18 points, would remind us of each one of these different things that we needed to pray for for the whole house of Israel and for our sanctification. You are not to offer unauthorized incense on it or burnt offering or grain offering, and you're not to pour a drink offering on it. Aaron is to make atonement on its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. He is to make atonement for it once a year throughout all your generations. It is especially holy to Adonai. And this is where our Torah portion closes, but I want to look at some of the symbolism and then move into the Hof Torah because we're going to start covering the prophet section each week and showing how it relates to the Torah portion. And so we're going to start this week by showing this correlation between the two. James 5.16 says, the effectual fervent prayer of just anyone? No, of a righteous man availeth much. So this means if you want power to your prayers, start living out the Torah of selfless love. And that righteousness will manifest itself in power in your prayer life. Your iniquities, Isaiah 59, 2 says, separate you from God. So if 1 John 3, 4 says sin is the transgression of the Torah, then that means by not knowing what the Torah says, by not observing it, by not taking care of it, you're actually separating yourself from the very source of life, which means to say that you are severing yourself from life and entering into the domain of death. This is why sin is self-destructive. Sin kills. Remember Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. That's severing yourself from the source of God. Your sins, your iniquities separate you from God, but the gift of God is eternal life through Yeshua. Your sins hide his face from you so that it seems like he doesn't hear. So this means if we're engaging in any sin in our lives, it's going to seem like your prayers are not answered, like God's not hearing it. You're going to seem so distant. And I'm sure all of us have experienced that at different times in our life where we've prayed and we've cried out to God, and yet we know there's some issue in our life that we need to deal with, and it just doesn't seem like we can, in, we can come into that oneness with Him until that issue is resolved in the life and either purified or rebuked or asked forgiveness for or rectified, made reconciliation with our fellow man. All of these things enhance our prayer life. And if sin is the iniquity or the transgression of the Torah, then returning to Torah is actually going to help our prayer life too. David, uh, Solomon in Proverbs 28 verse 9 says, Whoever turns away his ear from hearing the Torah, even his prayer will be an abomination to the Lord. This is huge. If anybody is telling you that Torah is not important, they're basically going to make your prayer life, your communication with God, an abomination. So don't Listen to these false shepherds who tell you that God's word is not valid for today. Our prayers are hindered when we transgress God's Torah. 1 John 4, 5, verse 14 and 15 says, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, and what's His will? It's selfless love, right? So if we ask anything unselfishly for our fellow man, for the good of the body, he hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whoever we ask, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired of Him. Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our feebleness. 
for we know not what we should pray for, and we don't even know how. <laughs> how many times have you felt like that? You're praying, you know you got all these heavy burdens, but you don't even know how to pray. It says in those moments, the Spirit intercedes with groanings deeper than words for us on our behalf. The Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings deeper than words. Praise God for the Spirit who knows our very heart's intent and what we want to pray and how we ha want to pray for our brothers and sisters, yet we don't even know how to. We're like babes. We're still in the milk. It's time to grow up and mature in the Word and become sanctified and know how to pray and know how to make our prayers effectual by returning to the Torah and living a righteous life. John 3, 5 says, Yeshua answered, Verily I say to you, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This is symbolic of the cleansing that we all need to go through. We need to be a pure kingdom of priests. Paul says in Hebrews 10, 22, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts cleansed of the evil conscience. This is what it represented by Moses cleansing Aaron and the priest, cleansing even the memory of sin. You know why sin comes back into the life? Because we remember it. We remember the taste of it. We remember the smell of it. We remember how it feels. And God wants us to be cleansed of not only the memory of sin, but even the guilt and self-condemnation that comes along with it. Sometimes we beat ourselves up so badly that where's our focus when we're beating ourselves up or we're letting somebody else beat us up and point the finger? Our focus falls off of God. We look at ourselves and we say, I hate that about myself. I want to change it. But if you're looking at yourself, remember the principle, by beholding, you become changed into the same likeness. You only become more like that ugly self that you hate so much. So guilt is followed by self-condemnation and self-condemnation followed by self-loathing. And is that sanctifying? No. Only by getting outside of yourself and looking at the Father, the author and finisher of our faith, and keeping your eyes on Him, then by beholding His beautiful nature of selfless love, you become changed into that perfect nature. And you look back at yourself and you say, whoa, when did that change? When did that go by the wayside? Because you were perfected naturally by keeping your eyes on Him. This is what it means to have your conscience cleansed. You forget of even the old self. You forget of the old habits. You forget of the old struggles. And you're washed with the pure living water of Yeshua who reflected God's selfless love in the ultimate nature and laying down His life, showing total self-denial. Ephesians 5, 25 and 27 says, For Messiah loves the assembly of believers, and He gave Himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it. He didn't die so that you can keep on sinning. He died so that you can be sanctified and made holy and be an overcomer even as he's an overcomer. To cleanse you with the washing of water by what? The water only represents the Word of God. We're cleansed. That's why he said, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy Word is truth in John 17, 17. That he might present us the body of Messiah to himself as a glorious assembly, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. This is why the bride is to be without spot or blemish, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This is beautiful. So in this entrance, these are the very first things that you see. Even before you can enter the work of sanctification in the life, which the holy place represents, you first have to see that selfless love exemplified in Yeshua's sacrifice, and that woos you to desire to be cleansed and your conscience cleansed. Then you enter into washing of the word represented by the table of showbread, which starts to sanctify you, and the flowing through of the Holy Spirit, which shines as a light from you to others, and the prayers, which is constant communication with God. We're not supposed to just pray in the morning and in the evening, but what does 1 Thessalonians 5 say? Pray without ceasing. Yes. Amen. So our spiritual walk through the sanctuary is all focused on getting back to the Father and being one with Him. And this represents the whole plan of salvation, which in the outer court reveals our need for dying to self and submitting to God, confessing and repentance at the entrance. Remember, you'd have to confess your sins over the Lamb. So that was the offering sacrifice. Justification by faith at the altar uh, and the laver, cleansing, purification at the laver. And this is where, unfortunately, most stop in their spiritual walk. They don't want to go through the struggles of sanctifying their life, being set apart for holy, holy use. 
So most of the church stops right here, but God has revealed that if we're going to get back to his image, we have to go through this sanctifying process. Sanctification in the holy place sets us apart as a pure and holy bride. Through purity, we shine the light of Torah to the nations, represented by the menorah. And we live a life in harmony with Torah, unleavened by sin, represented by the unleavened bread. And our righteous life is mixed with prayer, like a fragrant aroma to the Lord, represented by the altar of incense. And then we can go through the veil into the most holy place, through Yeshua, who is the veil, who is lifted. We have access to God. He's the one that lifts our ignorance, the veil of ignorance. We're to be holy as first fruits of priests like Aaron and his sons, keeping God's commandments, which are represented, housed in the Ark of the Covenant, and feeding on the spiritual manna, which Yeshua says, I was that spiritual manna your forefathers ate in the wilderness, the ultimate revelation. So with that, let's stand and we'll close in prayer. Abba Father, we just thank you for revealing to us your amazing plan to not only sanctify us, you have saved us, you have sanctified us, but you desire to purify us and perfect us so that we can have a most holy place experience with you. We desire to be one with you again, Father. And we desire to be recreated in your image. So we pray that your Ruach HaKodesh would sanctify us in your truth through your word, your Torah, and your living word, Yeshua. And we praise your holy name and we look forward to the day that Yeshua will return as a bridegroom for the bride. And may we be that bride grafted into Israel without spot or blemish. We love you, Father. We look forward to that day. And we just pray that we would be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable in your sight. In everything that we think, and everything that we say, and everything that we do, this is the desire of our heart, Father, to return to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen.